Hello, we are here at the Missouri Botanical Garden today. We are in front of the Sachs Museum, which has just reopened to guests just in the past week. But before I talk more about that, I'll say I'm Christina, I'm here with Cassidy, and we are here today to give you a virtual tour of the garden. So let me turn this camera around and we'll show you where we are. So we are here right next to this really nice bed here in front of the Sachs Museum. You may recognize this building here, the Herring House, which is also a favorite building of some of our visitors on grounds. And one of the really interesting things I noticed in this bed is this plant right here. Um, some of you may recognize it because you have one of these uh, inside your house. This is called a ZZ plant um, and it is one of those house plants that's on just about every list of, of house plants you can't kill because um, it survives uh, it survives a, a great deal of neglect. So it's a great uh, plant for um, house plant parents that are just starting out uh, and and I had never seen it planted outside before. Uh, it's, tro it's, it's tropical, so it's not something that you can leave outside all winter and it'll come back the next year, but kind of neat to see it in this, um, in this context, uh, in this bed. And that really waxy, dark foliage is, um, uh, works really well in this design, um, which is, as Christina was mentioning, where we're starting our tour outside of the museum building, which uh, the, the brick building you see on the, um, on the right here is the original museum for the garden that opened uh, when the garden opened in 1859. Uh, and for those who are unfamiliar, as we go to the other side of this hedge here, um, you'll see the new addition that was added um, to the museum just a couple of years ago and what that um, what that creates is actually some better uh, access into the gallery spaces inside the museum and so right now there's an exhibit uh, called grafting the grape that's all about grapes and wine um, and uh, it's definitely worth a stop uh, if you're here on garden grounds, in addition to the beauty that you see outside, there's a lot of really cool uh, botanical illustrations um, and a really neat look at some of the science that, that goes into making sure that uh, that bottle of wine that you uh, may pick up at the store is enjoyable. So, uh, so this building, the newer building, is how you get in um, into that space. So when you come and, and visit, don't go to the doors in the brick, the, the red brick building, come around to this side where the new addition is. But it is open as of uh, about, about a week ago. About a week ago. And you can also learn more about the exhibit and plan your visit at mobot.org slash museum. So here across the way is the Herring House. And this is a really, really beautiful garden, especially right now. It's just really exploding with a lot of pinks and purples. You can see here these taller ones. This is Gladiolus. There's a taller pink one um, in the background there that's Gladiolus as well. We have some globe thistle, which is a favorite of bees. I can see two bees on it right now, despite the fact that it's starting to drizzle a little. You usually don't see bees out, but it kind of seems like all the ones that are out are here on this globe thistle. Yeah, and a couple of the other uh, flowers of note that are showing up here um, in this garden right now are the cone flower um, that's right here in front of us and then there's also um, some blazing star which are the taller stalks of kind of 
brighter purple here um, that you see along the, the pathway. Uh, and this is a garden area that is, uh, was all recently replanted um, just in the, last, in the last few years. And so it's really uh, grown in to be a um, kind of a, a showstopper space with this uh, boxwood hedge here. Um, providing the definition and the, the stone backdrop of the Herring House. Uh, and they're not in bloom now, but there's some really pretty climbing roses that um, are part of this landscape as well. And there's a hydrangea, uh, a pink hydrangea over there in the corner that's giving a nice pop of color. And for people who've, um, who've been to the garden before um, and, and may kind of recognize this, this area, um, there used to be a, a more solid fence here uh, on this little uh, sort of yard space off of the back of the Herring House. And it, it was recently replanted. Uh, the fence, uh, the solid fence was removed and was, was planted with this um, hedge and what that does is it gives you a nice little peek into um, this space back here um, which was uh, the design of which was was modeled after uh, landscape designer Gertrude Jekyll and um, you know it's meant to kind of provide these waves of, of colors as the season uh, seasons progress so right now you're seeing some, some kind of soft purples, a little bit of yellow, um, and that's a, a neat space that um, is off limits in terms of being able to, to physically walk back there, but you get this little peek through the, the hedge here. And Christina, uh, neither you or I uh, brought our garden umbrellas with us which is unfortunate. Those are, uh, though, available if you sign up for a membership. Uh, that is one of the membership gifts that we're offering right now are those umbrellas. So perfect for a day like this where uh, kind of dodging some, sh some showers here and there. Uh, but this isn't too bad. Wow. OK, so we're walking through the daylily garden, which is all beautiful. But look at how, look at this really dark color on this daylily. Just kind yeah, of that's amazing. Uh, I don't know that I've seen one that's, that's quite that. And um, what caught my eye was this next to it here. Um, just how many buds are yet to open. Yeah, and we, uh, we focused on the, uh, featured the daylily garden about three or four weeks ago uh, on our last tour um, because June is, is typically a, the peak month for daylilies, but you can see they're, they're just they're humming along, hanging out in July here as well. Uh, still looking really good. A um, lot of that, just a lot of color as you kind of walk through and, and take a look. Yeah, it's really bright red here. That is really bright. Scarlet Pansy, I think, is the cultivar name for that one. There are definitely a lot of warmer tones with daylilies, a lot of reds and oranges and yellows. And I, that's part of what made that really dark purple one so striking yeah. among all the all those um, brighter, sunnier colors. Yeah, this is definitely one of those one of those areas in the garden right now that if you're planning your visit, you want to make sure you swing. Uh, swing through this area and see the daylilies while they're still here. And they'll, uh, 
uh, just based on what we're seeing here and all the all the buds that we're seeing that that aren't open yet I, I think we've we've still got a few more weeks of uh, peak daylily bloom so definitely worth coming out and and seeing and really you know lily uh, in its broad in the broadest sense of the word is kind of the the star for this time of year. We have the day lilies that are in bloom. We also have the Asiatic lilies um, that are uh, blooming as well. And then um, also the water lilies. So botanically, none of those three are related, but, uh, but they are, they do all have the common name lily um, and, and they are all uh, looking pretty good right now. So. So we're going to move from the day lilies over to the water lilies this is our next stop uh, as we walk down this path. And you can see even from here that super bright red of the impatience variety that is planted in the central axis this year. It's really, really striking and, um, and beautiful. And it looks great with the sort of tropical greenery. Yeah, this is a really great, I mean, I think the displays on, on the central axis is what we call it, this space between the um, Spink Pavilion here where, where some of you are used to maybe getting brunch um, and then the Climatron. This, uh, this axis here, it just looks really fantastic this year. And Christina can give you this close up of the impatience, and you also see uh, some canna flowers as well as some um, uh, palm trees here. And so, just a really beautiful tropical feel on these little corner beds around the lily pools. Um, and, the, and the water lilies are something that we've kind of touched on. They've actually been in, uh, in the pools for about two months now, um, but it, it is just taking them a while to, uh, uh, well, it's taken a while for the temperatures to warm up to where they like them. And, and now they're really starting to thrive and you can see that in the pools now. You can see some blooms on some of these water lilies here. This purple one closer to the camera and then farther away, the pink blooms. Yeah, and I, uh, this is a really neat pool out of all the water lily uh, pools that we display. Um, I love this one because these feature all water lilies that were um, created at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Uh, created by uh, George H. Pring when he worked here, who did uh, a lot of hybridizing of both water lilies and orchids. And so this is a, a pool that is here specifically to um, display his work, uh, which ties directly to the history of the Missouri Botanical Garden. You can see the raindrops on the water there. It's starting to rain a bit. So we will, we will see how much more we can show you. We might cut our tour a little bit short today to save our equipment too much grief. But I think we can. Yeah, we can, we can. And I'm wondering if we go around, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what, uh, what cultivars we have in this pool, but uh, George Pring did make a couple of varieties that he gave St. Louis names. So I'm kind of hoping that one of those um, is in the, in the pool. Yeah, here we go. This is what I was hoping for. So this one right here um, I love is called St. Louis Gold. So this yellow water lily um, was actually hybridized here by George Pring and he gave it the name St. Louis Gold. So a nice cool tie-in uh, 
for the city of St. Louis to be featured uh, in the name of this really pretty water lily. And here's something kind of neat um, over here. We were talking, you know, we're talking. So this is, um, aside from the displays outside of the pools, um, we have these displays here. So there's more impatiens, there's more canna. These are all papaya. And you can actually see here the papaya flowers. So whether... Uh, whether these will get to the point of bearing fruit, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know how long it takes from, from flower to, to fruit. Although actually, here we go. Looking here, you can see an old speck one. flower yeah. that's starting to, to um, create a fruit. So um, there are a, a few dozen papayas here that are all, um, that's what's creating this height and this foliage here uh, above the impatience again on this um, uh, on these beds and then as we uh, as we wait for the tram to pass uh, great way to uh, get out of the rain for a little bit too if you're if you're here take a tram tour yeah um, but this is this is neat too. You can see this real big flower about the size of a soccer ball um, is Victoria Longwood Hybrid. So this pool has our Victoria water lilies, and um, so it has the species Victoria cruziana and Victoria amazonica, and then it has this hybrid of the two called Longwood Hybrid, which was also something that George Pring worked on uh, when his career took him to Longwood Gardens, which is why it has the name Longwood Hybrid, uh, and that's outside of Philadelphia. But you can see the size of these yeah. lily well, just pads. Just for scale, you can um, see. This is my hand on this. It's hardly taking up any space Yeah, the and these lily pad. See if I can do this without sticking myself, but you can kind of see these these spines on here and so the spines and the rigidity of the structure of these leaves allows them to uh, float on the water like this um, and and can actually hold a significant amount of, of weight um, the you know, maybe you've seen in the, in the past there's some pictures of like the, uh, the particularly famous one from here of a woman playing a violin on these lily pads. Um, and they, what they do is they put a board down because the plant tissue itself is, is something you'd fall right through. If I, if I tried to step on that right now, I'd fall through. Um, but the the size of the pad is big enough with a little extra sturdying from a, a board or a, a plank of some sort that that somebody i couldn't stand on it <laughs> i'm probably a little bit too heavy but certainly a, a child ch or a very small assault. person yeah and that is not an open invitation to try that <laughs> with your own child because they will fall they through will. <laughs> um, there are no lifeguards present at this pool <laughs> uh, this is another neat plant I um, was looking up the other day. So this is, um, there's some dahlias in here, and then this is a castor bean plant, um, which is pretty neat. So if you're familiar with castor oil um, as, a, as a product, um, this is what castor oil comes from. and. It's re a really beautiful plant. I mean, this, this red um, foliage and the size of these leaves, I mean, you know, <laughs> bigger than my head, those leaves are. Um, so kind of a really neat play off of the papayas uh, in the other beds and then coming in here and, and switching it up with these castor bean. Um, plants. Uh, 
and we were talking, yeah, we were just talking about um, lilies, and as we pop over here into the bulb garden, um, here's one, this is called a Turk's cap lily. So these are actually, we've, we've now seen day lilies, um, water lilies, and now we're getting into the true lilies, which are members of the lily family, Liliaceae. So this is Lilium henryi, which uh, the common name for is Turk's cap lily, and you can see the up, uh, kind of the upturned nature of that one. It's really striking. There's a real nice bed here, along with some gladiolas like we were featuring um, before. And if we turn around and go this way, you can see this path here has a bunch of lilies here all staked up. Yeah, it's almost hard to really take in on a yeah. screen. Lots of reds and whites and pinks. And a lot of these are really, really large flowers too. You can see, again, with the size of my hand, how much bigger these flowers are. Some cone flower in here too. Yeah, so July is definitely a good month to come out and see all things lily. Um, I even see, I'm a little sad we missed the flowering, but I can see the I can see the foliage. So right here is um, this is the leaf of a plant that's um, called devil's tongue. It's a um, it's an aeroid, a, a amorphophallus conjac, and so this is related to uh, the the corpse flower that you know draws all the attention every year because it's huge and it stinks. Um, this is actually a, co a cousin that is winter hardy here in the St. Louis area. It's not native to here, but it will uh, survive the, the St. Louis winters. And, and it's I, also stinky. And it stinks, it does. <laughs> uh, it usually flowers in, uh, or blooms in May. So we miss the flowering, but it's kind of neat to see the, the foliage here and you can kind of see there's a, little, there's a little patch here of it. So if you're here on the right weekend in May, um, you can enjoy it, it without yeah. the stink. There's some more of that gladiolus. More lilies. The hosta garden is looking great right now as well. Just a lot of different colors going on in this area. I wanted to come back and kind of get a wider view of that just rainbow of colors here. Yeah, a lot of that, that dark purple along the ground is um, oxalis. It's, it's shamrock and you know the, the, the purple color of the leaves is, is really what's kind of taking your attention, but those are in flower now. And if you um, get up close enough to it, you'll see the little flowers. That are kind of poking out. And so that's, you know, th this is a plant that's known as shamrock. That's a little bit different from the clover shamrock that um, you might you might think of. And we'll end.
end here with this view of the rose garden, which you can see is also definitely a place that you will want to stop by when you're here. You can see how many blooms are still going and, um, and the smell that was in the air, the rain kind of knocked some of that out just now. But when I walked through here earlier, it was just wonderful. Yeah, and I, uh, I'll mention I've, I've talked to the Rosarian uh, Matthew and he says days like this where it's a little cooler and rainier and uh, what most of us would consider gloomy that's actually days that the roses like so they'll probably get a nice little bounce back from a day like today and look even better um, in the week to come. So thank you all for tuning into our tour today. Make sure you visit the garden while all these different types of lilies and more is in bloom and be sure to stop by the Sachs Museum while you're here to see the Grafting the Grape exhibit. We hope you tune in again next time. Till then, bye.